Good afternoon. I am Erica Bolden. I'm a proud Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta board member, as well as a past Rebel Women Luncheon panelist. And on behalf of Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta's Women Giving Circle, Champions Club for Girls, I want to welcome you to the fifth annual Rebel Women Luncheon. We are connected today in the spirit of International Women's Day, and of course, all of you know that was March 8th, and that's a global day that was officially recognized, but we celebrate with events like this luncheon throughout Women's History Month by honoring the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. According to the World Economic Forum, sadly, none of us will see gender parity in our lifetime. Gender parity won't be attained for well over a century. But by coming together for moments like this, we are raising awareness of the challenges facing women and helping to create a fairer world for future generations. The theme for today's Rebel Women's Luncheon is empowering women, igniting change. Soon you'll hear from an outstanding group of women during our panel discussion today, and our speakers will share their experiences with empowering women, empowering themselves, and igniting change in their schools, workplaces, and beyond. How many of you attended last year's luncheon? Awesome, thank you. So if you attended last year, you'll remember you received a pink hammer to symbolize smashing the glass ceiling. And so this year at your seat, you each have a flashing ring. Okay, this is way better than some of the rings that probably some of us are wearing today, right? So this year you have this flashing ring and you also have these lovely pink heart-shaped sunglasses. You can feel free to wear those. Um, but with this ring, slip it on. If you squeeze the top, that's when it lights up. And so we hope that anytime you hear our panel say something that moves you, you'll wave your ring in the air, okay? So it's like a silent, okay? That's a, this is like a silent yes, okay? <laughs> So they'll light up, you put them on, and then the pink sunglasses, that's a way of symbolically looking at the world through the eyes of women today and always. So feel free to put these on too. You're also in for a treat today. Our very own Jaden T, 2023 to 2024, BGCMA Youth of the Year and 2024 State Youth of the Year runner up will be a part of the panel. And you'll have the opportunity, yes, and you'll also have the opportunity to hear about some of what she has been up to since becoming our Youth of the Year in November 2023. But first, you might be wondering, why rebel women? And I, now I think I understand why you asked me to do this today. The world is nowhere without women who are rebellious, right? So you'll be familiar with the popular children's book series, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. Boys and Girls Clubs created a curriculum based on this book, and it highlights great women throughout history. Rebel girls question ideas that are unfair, choose to be themselves even when it's not popular, and create a better world for others. BGCMA's Champions Club for Girls wanted to inspire and connect women by creating a space to promote the rebel in all of us. Today's Rebel Women Luncheon was made possible through the generous support of several sponsors, so thank you, thank you, thank you to our sponsors. Our Trailblazer sponsors, Papa John's, Truist, and Ryan Companies. Our Changemaker sponsors, Atlanta Hawks and Forvis. And our Empower sponsors, Emory Executive Education and the Pipes Family Foundation. So big thank you to all of our sponsors and attendees for being champions for women and girls. We also have to thank our Rebel Women Luncheon Planning Committee, led by BGCMA board member Clotine Jasmine. I think I saw Clotine and BGCMA's Senior Director of Individual Giving, Whitney Brown. Will all the volunteers and staff members that served on the planning committee please stand so that we can also recognize you. <laughs> Wonderful job, ladies, thank you. Now I'm here to tell you a little bit more about what Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta is doing for kids in this community is BGCMA President and CEO, David Jernigan. Good afternoon. Okay, so my script says, written by my team, David puts on his glasses. I'm gonna need you all to help me out. Everyone, put your glasses on, please. We've got this is a group project here today. We're gonna, we're gonna have some fun together. Y'all look great. 
So I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta, as Erica said. And I want to start first with gratitude to Erica for serving as our MC, uh, the incredible host committee, our Champions Club, as well as the staff. We were out here yesterday afternoon for hours putting this all together. And I just want to thank everyone for your uh, commitment and your service on a Sunday afternoon to make this possible for our, our community. Our Champions Club for Girls is a great group of women who come together um, to really advocate and to provide resources for young women in our clubs. Um, our young girls have uh, come to rely on, be excited about their senior send-off bags from the Champions Club that they get when they get to graduation, uh, full of supplies that they need to start um, life on their own. And so thank you all for that. And from fitness days to silent auctions, your contributions as the Champion Club for Girls um, really helps to promote leadership development um, and to make sure that our young people have all that they need um, to make a difference in their lives. So thank you, Champions Clubs, as well. Um, so here at Boys and Girls Clubs of, of Atlanta, we have the opportunity to ignite the unlimited potential of kids and teens by creating safe, inclusive, and engaging environments for over 7,000 young people across Metro Atlanta. We are in 10 counties across Metro Atlanta with 25 clubs, open in those critical out-of-school hours from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. every day, um, serving young people who have such promise when they show up in our clubs and making sure that we are providing them with the supports that they need to go on and live their great futures. And we we do that because of the generous support of our community. Um, and we have a vision as part of our RISE 2025 plan to continue to expand our impact to serve more kids more often with greater impact. And it's opportunities like this where we get to tell the community what's happening in our clubs that allow us to do that and to fulfill that, uh, that mission. You know, since coming out of the pandemic, I don't need to tell you all that our young people are seeing greater and greater needs. Everything from mental health to academic recovery. Um, we have really tried to lean in as part of the network and the village surrounding our families and our kids to provide additional support for young people to make sure that they have everything that they need to thrive. And that's including our young women um, in the Champions Club really helped to, to bolster that support. You're going to have the opportunity today, as Erica said, to hear from one of our most incredible young women, Miss Jaden, our Youth of the Year. Um, she is going to elevate the youth voice in today's conversation and going to join the panel. Um, I've had the opportunity to engage with Jaden and I, I promise you, if I had half the level of confidence and poise that she she has at a young age. I don't know where I would be today, but that young lady is going places, and I can't wait for you to meet her. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over, or turn it over to another fabulous woman on my team, our Chief Programs and Operations Officer. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Terry Fish back. And you can take the glasses off now. As an organization where women constitute about 65% of our workforce and girls constitute about 48% of our club membership, we see rebel women igniting the unlimited potential of rebel girls at our 25 clubs across Metro Atlanta. Our dedicated staff mentors and girl empowerment programs help guide through their journey into womanhood. At BGCMA, we're also fortunate to have the support of volunteer leaders like yourselves and community partners that champion, um, like Champions Girls for Champions Club for Girls, who understand the value of investing in our girls. Our most recent programs include the GYM program, which is a statewide initiative to increase physical activity and fitness levels of Georgia's middle school girls through activities designed and led by girls. We also have the Smart Girls program, which is a national program from Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And it's a small group health and fitness and education and self-esteem program that helps our young ladies build skills for eating right, staying physically fit, and getting good food and health care, developing positive relationships with peers and adults. And then lastly, we have co-ed leadership opportunities like our Torch Club, as well as our Keystone Club, which is a leadership development program. I now want to introduce you to a young lady that I've known to become a rebel girl who is quickly becoming a rebel woman, uh, Miss Jaden, our 2023-2024 Youth of the Year. And Jaden, if you can join me now on stage. 
Jaden is a member of our Matthews Boys and Girls Clubs and is, a passionate, and is passionate about mental health and wellness. As a part of the Youth of the Year Leadership Program, she had to prepare a brief speech in which we, uh, she presented at the Georgia YOY competition. Now, I don't know if that's what she's talking about today. It is. It is, right? So you'll have an opportunity to hear from her today, so I'll hand it over to you, Jaden. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, how are we feeling today? Great. Michelle Obama once said, success isn't about how much money you make, it's about the difference you make in people's lives. Good afternoon ladies, and I do see a few gentlemen in the room. Before we get into it, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jaden Tarver, and I'm the proud 2023-2024 Youth of the Year for Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta and the 2024 Youth of the Year for the Georgia State. Thank you. As I walk through life, sometimes I feel overwhelmed, pain. Starting in my junior year of high school, I was faced with mental health challenges. I found myself shoving all of the overwhelming pressures from school and extracurricular activities on the back burner, and over time, my mental health went downhill. Because of my personal struggle, I know how difficult it can be to keep going, and that's a feeling no one should ever experience. I know how it feels to be unsure of what my next steps are. This is why I've chosen to use my platform to advocate for mental health awareness, to show other teens that there is a way out and that they're not alone. Mental health is such an important topic, but it's sometimes stigmatized in our society. It doesn't have to be like that. Purpose. In the summer leading up to my junior year, I received an opportunity to speak on behalf of Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta in a program called National Youth of Advocacy Days in the nation's capital. This experience helped me carve out my path and my life ahead of me, making that unsure feeling I once felt fade. After my experience at National Youth of Advocacy Days, I will major in political science at the illustrious Howard University, hashtag Go Bison. <laughs> Thank you. Where I will learn to lead the next generation, leaving my impact. This is my vision of success. I am reminded of the words of Michelle Obama who emphasized that success is not solely measured by financial wealth, but by the positive impact you make on people's lives. Today, I stand before you driven by a sense of purpose to advocate for mental health awareness, inspired by my own personal challenge. In doing so, I strive to empower not only my fellow youth, but other women to embrace our unique stories and voices and experiences as we contribute to a world where everyone feels seen, heard, and valued, creating a more inclusive and supportive society for all. Thank you. Thank you, Jaden. I'm so inspired by you every time I hear you speak. And so I've had the pleasure to hear Jaden T speak many times as you have as well. I can't wait to see what else you have to accomplish. And so I spent some time in DC, so I'll get you some connections before you go. Uh, so serving on today's panel, um, please join me on stage as I call your name. We have Katie Saez. She is George, she's with Georgia Region President um, of Truist. And then... We also have Kathy Waller. She is the executive director of Atlanta Committee for Progress. All right, so you can read more all about the panelists in today's program. This panel is all in the spirit again of International Women's Day and thinking about women empowerment. So I would just like to hear um, from our panelists here. What would you tell your younger self about personal finance? <laughs> A lot, right? And how have your views on saving, investing, and planning for the future shifted over the years? I think we'll start with you, Kathy. Yeah, I'll go before the banker. Um, <laughs> so I would tell my younger self um, something actually very similar to what I heard when I was younger. My parents, especially my father, said to me that um, I should always be striving to save 10% of my income. And I mean, my parents did that. 
And so I, you know, there were times when I was able to do it and times when I wasn't, but you know, it does pay off over the long run. But the other thing I think that I would, that I learned um, when I started working uh, at the Coca-Cola company at, in, in my career was that as much as I wanted salary increases, I wanted equity because equity builds and equity is what actually leads to long-term wealth. And whether that be in your house or whether that be equity that you're given through stocks. So I learned, I had to learn that because my parents couldn't teach me that. Um, so I had to learn that on the job, but I'm glad I did. All right, so now from the banker. I've always been pretty passionate about, about financial management because I believe that if you have a good, solid understanding and control of your finances, it leads to empowerment in life. And so I grew up with a, a single mom who uh, we struggled to make ends meet, but we also had a pretty firm discipline in the importance of savings. And so that was ingrained in me. That wasn't something that I had to learn. But a couple of things that I have adjusted as I went through college and then started a career and got to a point to where I was saving and investing and perhaps earning a little bit of equity as well. And a couple of things that served me well are about um, <clears throat> taking advantage of the free or the included benefits that come with your place of employment. So an example of that is your 401k match. I would always recommend that anyone maximize or max out their 401k, but if you can't do that, at least take advantage of the company match. But there are so many other benefits that your employer is going to offer that may not be financial as well. Some of it might be like a um, matching, uh, a, a company match on um, donations or philanthropic giving. That is money that you can contribute forward. And I think that's a great way to um, take advantage of that. Um, another thing is time off. We don't always think about time off as being a financial benefit, but it is. We have earned it, we deserve it, we need it, and it creates empowerment. So I always encourage everyone to take advantage of, of, of those benefits. And there are others as well that come with it. The other thing, the other part of your question, Erica, was about how have your financial priorities changed over time? And for someone who grew up very much the saver's mindset, um, I have found that as I got older and um, really started to understand what was most important to me and to my family, my priority shifted on how I spend money. And I now give myself the grace to spend money on the things that are most important to me. And um, for me, that's travel and spending time with my family. So I might go over budget on a vacation and I'm okay with that. And it took, a, it took a while to give yourself the grace to really go over budget on something. But if it's important to you and your family, I think that's, um, that's um, important. Okay, so one last story. I feel like I'm hogging this question. I will give it right back. But someone gave me this advice when I was very early in my career and it's something that I just love. Um, when you start a job, oftentimes you get paid a salary and then you might earn a bonus. Someone told me early on, save half your bonus, but use part of your bonus to buy yourself something that's going to remind you of the fact that you earned it. And so early on, early in my career, it might be maybe a new pair of work shoes or a new suit back when you wore suits to work every day, a new suit to build up your closet. But then over time, it involved into something, often in the last few years, it's become my work bag. And every time I put my work bag on my shoulder and I walk out the door, it's just a reminder of hard work, and that hard work pays off, and a bit of the connection back to reward being at work. Katie, you are speaking to me, girl. <laughs> okay, vacations and shopping. Yes, ma'am. All right, so um, on that track, right, and making sure that you're taking advantage of days, usually what I tell people, they say, oh, what did you do this weekend? Instead of saying nothing, I've learned to say, oh, I'm enjoying that home that I spend so much money on, or great I'm listening to my body and going to rest. So, Jaden, you know, you've talked about your platform as the youth of the year, or, yeah, being around mental health. So can you talk a little bit about why you're passionate about mental health, and then what advice would you offer to our audience? Yes. So I would say the reason why I'm so passionate about mental health besides my personal struggle, it's definitely seeing family members and teens and um, 
you know, people that I care for deeply, them going through their own mental health challenges. And I would say to you all, find your own outlet. Self-care is super, super, super important. And you have to pour into yourself before you pour into anyone else. I know there's a lot of mothers and parents in the, in the audience, but it's just very important to take care of yourself so you can be your best self for your people you're taking care of. So that's my biggest advice. How do you self-care? Wow. That's a great <laughs> I you asked Aiden, what does self-care mean to you? Yes, self-care to me is taking time by myself, turning on some music. I love Beyonce. Usually, yes. <laughs> Usually when I'm taking time for myself, I play her Lemonade album, I do my word search, and I just focus on the moment and, you know, cut out all of everything that's happening around me, my reality, really. And I just fall deep into that. I also love dance. Dance is my way of expression. So I try to make sure that I, I do some dancing. Um, those are the ways that I take care of myself. Thank you. That's wonderful. Okay, so shifting gears, so you're talking about self-empowerment, what you're doing for self-care and investing in yourself. Let's talk about empowering others. What are some of the ways you've empowered your female colleagues? And thinking about that, who has empowered you in the workplace or what are the ways you've empowered yourself? So when I was at Coca-Cola, I had the pleasure of um, starting and chairing the first women's leadership program for the company, which was an opportunity to help the company get more women into senior leadership. And it involved uh, starting with a group of women from around the globe. Uh, and uh, the, I mean, the sole purpose was to increase the number of women in senior leadership positions. And we created a course that we, it was called Women in Leadership that helped women to understand that they, um, first of all, what they wanted, because it's important to understand what you want. You can, uh, everybody, others can tell you what is a good idea for you to go do, but it's important to stop and figure that out for yourself. Because sometimes, I mean, it comes with sacrifices to go into senior leadership roles. And so do you want those sacrifices is the question. And so we taught them what it would take to get there and asked the very simple question to think about whether you want it. And what we found was that many women have never stopped to think about what they really wanted. And we gave them an opportunity to work with uh, coaches during that program. And it was a week-long program. And they could... Um, also learn about other parts of the business that they didn't know about um, from their daily jobs. So we really wanted them to get a good glimpse of what it looked like to get into a senior role and to decide if that was something that they wanted. And once they decided it was something that they wanted, we talked to them about, um, how, about how to go about getting it and how to go back into their leadership teams, which were around the world, and tell them that that's something that they wanted. And what we ended up creating was an amazing, powerful group of women over the years who, and if you look at Coca-Cola now, they have a great pipeline of senior leaders, women's, women leaders. But we created this woman, group of women leaders who knew what they wanted and were um, unapologetic about going to get it. Um, through this program. So that was for me, uh, actually the way I learned myself that I even needed that kind of boost. And they often empowered me. They, I, I learned as much through those programs as, as we taught. Um, I, when, you're, when you're with a group of people who are thinking about and striving towards something, you often learn as much about yourself. And so those programs were very fulfilling for me and the other women who took part of them and going around the world talking to senior leaders and a asking them questions about why. Why weren't there more women in leadership in their organizations, in their parts of the business? Um, and the stories that you heard and then having discussions about, okay, wait, okay, understand where you're coming from, but give, let me give you a different perspective um, and seeing that change. And frankly, the reason that worked for the company, because when we started, um, the way we defined leadership was director and above. So when we started, it was uh, like 14% globally. When, when I left the program, it was 31% globally. And the reason it worked, though, is because uh, the, the tone at the top, very top of the, of the um, organization, the CEO wanted it to work and therefore made it a priority for the company. So, yeah, it was a great program. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. So 
Katie, I'd like to ask, do you have a mentor or a sponsor? And if so, how did you find them? And what are some tips you would offer to anyone who is looking for a mentor? I have many. They've evolved over time. Mentors and sponsors and advocates as well. I think everyone plays a little bit of a different role in your career, um, both professionally but also personally as well. Um, for those of you, I, I recognize that some younger folks in the room may not know who Oprah is. I think everyone knows who Oprah is. I mean, I grew up, but the difference is I grew up watching Oprah at four o'clock every day. And do you remember that, right? You got home from school and turned on Oprah Winfrey, um, who was really one of the rebel women of, of our generation, right? But uh, Oprah once gave this interview where um, she answered a similar question about mentoring other people. She goes, I hate it when people ask me to mentor them. It's awkward and, you know, I don't have time for it. And, and I was really impressed with her candor in that response. But my takeaway there was that her point was having a mentoring, mentorship relationship with somebody. It's very, it's very personal and oftentimes can be very intimate in what you discuss. And so having that right relationship, I think it's really important if you're going to have a powerful mentoring partnership with somebody. And so I often get asked at work for me to be a mentor. And, and what I'll say is maybe, but let's start with a series of three 30-minute meetings. Tell me what's important to you and how I might be of service or of value to you. And let's just carve out time and we're going to have focused discussion as part of that. And you know what? If we like each other, if it works out well, we can keep having that, that conversation or that relationship. And that's, you know, that's probably the best way that I can define how to create organically a mentoring relationship with somebody. But I found also that a more important relationship is having someone who's willing to either be your advocate or sponsor for you. And this is someone either professionally or personally who is willing to speak up for you on your behalf and advocate for you when you are not in the room. And um, it's often women, more often than not, it's the men in the room. And when you have a male colleague or a male senior who's willing to kind of stand behind um, your contributions and, and maybe take a risk on what you could bring to either a project or an organization or a role, that's really powerful as well. So invest in, in, in building relationships. Oftentimes it's the mentor that grows into the advocate, but that's one that really has to be created organically. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I guess my approach is, is just a tiny bit different in that I, um, I have benefited so much from people being mentors to me and sponsors over the years. And so I, when, someone I'm, when I'm approached about mentoring someone, my immediate response is yes. Now I agree that the best mentoring relationships that I had for me kind of grew organically where we became friends and um, I got to know the person and, and we, the, we spent quality time together, but what I have come to also understand is that, you know, I get to meet people that I otherwise wouldn't meet, and sometimes it doesn't take a lot of time to help that person. You know, they have a question, or they have a, you know, it takes a, you know, couple of questions uh, that they need, and for me to understand really what the, it what, what what they think the issues are and then what I think the issues are, right? And so if I can help unlock something for them, I do my best to do that. You know, so the relationship may or may not last, that's okay. Um, but my goal is to, as quickly as I can, give them as much as I can to help them move forward. I don't, it doesn't need to be, so when I was in Coca-Cola, my mentoring relationships were more, more long-term because I needed them to be very long-term over a career, right? So today, uh, sometimes people, they just need the help. They just need the support. And so sometimes it doesn't need to be necessarily long-term. It just needs to be in the moment and focused on them and helping them move forward and, and unlocking whatever's in their way. Okay. Thank you for that. Jaden. And thinking about teen girls, and I'm, in, I'm curious about your perspective as well. What does a rebel woman look like for you, thinking about your age, right? Yeah. And then if you're thinking about rebel women and how they take their place, in your opinion, what steps should they take now to break ceilings in the future? I would definitely say using their voice 
and standing behind whatever issue they deem important and valuable. Like myself, I'm doing it with mental health, but whatever it is um, they deem important, just stand behind it. Though there may be people who disagree with what you're doing, you have to keep pushing forward. And because the best things come out of struggle, I feel. So sometimes there might be a little bit of struggle, but you have to keep pushing and you have to stand 10 toes down on whatever it is you believe. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So in thinking about you know everything that you've learned from BGCMA, right? It offers a variety of character and leadership opportunities. What's been the most valuable experience or takeaway you've had as a club member? I love this question. My most valuable experience would be being a hall monitor way back in the day at my club. That was my first leadership experience. I was able to help everybody get to where they needed to go. I don't think I was bossy, but I probably was a little bossy. But I was, I was, that was the first time I was ever fully emerged in that sort of role. And it's one I've definitely taken with me. And I learned so much from that about myself and about how to lead properly and how to be a great leader. Another experience would be Camp Kiwanis. Camp Kiwanis has taught me everything that I know. I owe it all to Miss Carly Robinson. She has poured so much into me. I, I have the most gratitude for her and everything that she's giving to the teens at camp. So Camp Kiwanis and me being a hall monitor, those are my most valuable experiences. Thank you. I love it. And, and you know, when you said bossy, right, there's so many nuances when it comes to the perception of bossy, right, nuances with gender, but that's a whole other panel. But. I'd like to ask both you, Katie and Kathy, at some point you noticed a shift in your power or influence in the workplace and beyond. When did you recognize your own power and how did you tap into it? So, okay. Uh, when did I recognize my own power? Um, it was gradual and it was, um, you know, after successful roles in, in my, within my career, you know, you, you learn, you start managing people um, and then you start leading people, which is, just, which is different. Um, and, and over time, as you are uh, leading people, you realize you're leading more than the people that work directly for you. Right? You're leading parts, other parts of the organization. You're leading other people. Other people, you recognize that um, everything communicates and people are always watching. Everybody's watching what you do. And therefore, you have a responsibility to make sure that what you do is truly not only what you want to communicate, but it's also it's clear what your values are and, and, and um, what the company's values are and that you're living those values. And so I think I learned uh, over time that when you know, everybody was watching, I had a leadership role and that in that role of being a leader, I needed to, my, my, my voice needed to be present. I needed to talk about what was not only important to me, but what was important to the company. If I saw something that I thought was um, inappropriate or could have been done better, I had a responsibility for not only the company, but for that person's learning to step up and, and help that person see at least my perspective. They didn't have to buy into it, but understood at least my perspective. Um, so that, that it, it was a very gradual change, but it was an important change to become a leader. Um, when I had my first child, I, I worked for an amazing uh, leader. His name was Bill, and he graduated from the Citadel. He was 65 years old. And I remember after I came back to work after my first child, he came into my office and very well-meaning said, um, I will be very supportive of you as a working mother but let me give you some advice. You will never see any of your male colleagues walk into the office and use their child as an excuse for being late to work. And, um, and it was very well-intentioned, and, and it was good advice at the time. And so I, I came to work for years showing up as corporate Katie. And um, that worked well for me for many years. Um, about five, six, seven, eight years later, I'm back in Atlanta in a new role, and I had been in this role for about six months. And we do annual employee uh, engagement surveys, and I got some really tough feedback from my team and my broader team about me as a leader. 
and I was trying to uncover, unpack this tough feedback, and I was asking someone to, to share why, and someone said, you know, Katie, you come to work every day as corporate Katie. Did you know that there are people on your team that don't even know you have children? <sighs> like, think about all the moms, and like, think about how, and here I was showing up, um, trying to be my best self in that environment, and I had left my authentic self at home. So it was really tough feedback, and I took it, and I owned it, and um, I, I changed the way that I talked about my family. But more importantly, the lesson for me was that I was also in a place in my career, you, the question was about power, and I was also in a place in my career where I realized I now had a responsibility to pay it forward by setting the right example to other young men and women in our company. And so I was, I would, when I left work early because I had a kid event, I loudly proclaimed it. I walked down the hall, I'm like, I'm leaving, going to a baseball game, to help normalize and, and make it acceptable that it's okay to put your family first when your family needs to be first. And, um, so that, that, it, it, it was a moment that it was a very humbling time for me as a mom and, and as a career woman. But I also think the lesson here too is, Kathy, as you said, as you grow and you navigate in your career, you're going to get some feedback and, you know, all of us, men and women, we just have to absorb it and, and that's a gift. You do with it what you want. And, and that was a moment, a pr pretty profound moment for me personally and professionally as well. Well, thank you. See, I in meetings all the time. Sorry, I have a vet appointment. That's my child. Uh, I essentially have a fourth grader. I mean, he's 10, you know? So, okay, Th that's, that's a good segue too because setting boundaries can be tough. How do you set boundaries? This question is for all of you. How do you set boundaries at work or home or school? And have you always felt like you could set a strong boundary or are there times when you felt it wasn't really appropriate to do that? I think your boundaries too are going to change over over your adult life, your your teenage and adult life as well. Um, in par one part of my career, I traveled a lot for work. So one of my boundaries, like one of my non-negotiables, was that if I was physically in Atlanta, I did not miss a kid event. And I recognize I come. I'm, I'm speaking from a position of privilege that I have the kind of job where if I have a kid event, I can put that on my work calendar and make that a priority. Not everybody has that privilege, but it was one that I had and I acknowledged it. Um, and because I, there would be somebody I would miss because I was traveling for work. Now I have a role that, that's very Atlanta and Georgia centric, so I don't travel often. So my boundaries and my non-negotiables have changed as well. One of the things that um, is important to me, I got this advice from another, uh, another woman, is I never walk into my home on my phone. I sit in my car and I finish up that work conference call or that conversation. I hang up and I walk into my home present. Now I might be on my laptop 30 minutes later, but it's, it's a bit of that, that, that ritual of, of showing your priorities. Um, so that's one of my boundaries or my non-negotiables that has changed over time. Well, um, anybody that has ever asked me about balance, I have to say I just suck at balance. I have always, and it's just never, yeah, it's just not what I do well. So, um, but I did have, my boundary was that if, if my family needed me, I was gone. But I built the, a reputation that allowed that to happen. So no matter what job I was in, people knew that I you know, would go do whatever my family needed. And I don't have kids, but I had aging parents at the time. And um, if they needed me for some reason, or if my sister's kids needed me for some reason, I was going to go. Now, I was going to come back, and I was going to be online, and then maybe online all night. And I was going to make my deliverables, but I was going to go where I was needed if my family needed me. And I allowed... Um, anybody else that worked in my team, the same grace. Because if you're, and we'd all figure out as a team how to cover for whatever you weren't, didn't get done or whatever it was, but if your children needed you, you were gone. Or your family needed you in some way. So my boundaries have always been about family. And I, I just have never been, had never been very good about personal boundaries in terms of you know, I'm taking care of me. Um, because, you know, I had family and then I have, you know, work responsibilities. Over the years, those, it's changed somewhat. 
and now I think of me as a priority. You know, I did retire, which helped <laughs> <laughs> me be able to do that. But I'm quite busy now doing board work, both community and, and, and public board work. And I, have, I do have a job. I'm executive director of the Atlanta Committee for Progress. And so I do have responsibilities. But one of those responsibilities is now to me. And so I take that a lot more seriously than I did as I was growing up. So I, you know, it, it, but it, it served me well at the time um, that I was, was at Coca-Cola and, and growing in my career. Um, and, and now this time in life is about me. So. Mm -hmm. you, Ms. Yes. I would say for myself, boundaries is definitely something I'm still continuously working on and something that I've had to put a lot of effort in setting. However, I think it's very important and I think it flows into self-care, just making sure you're taking care of yourself and making sure that you're pri prioritizing the things that you deem important and you're setting those boundaries. Um, boundaries can be very hard to set and I know for myself, I love advocating for others, but when it comes to myself, I'm a little hesitant. But I think it's very important to keep striving and learning how to set those boundaries. And once again, it's something I'm still continuously working on, but it's, it's a work in progress, but I'm getting there. So okay. just keep going. Oh yeah, it's, it's an ever evolving topic, right? Um, Thinking about power, there's been this traditional view of power, and I think that will differ depending on what you do for a living or what your home life looks like. But how has having more women at the table changed? You know, in thinking about how we view power in school, the workforce, and beyond. So do you see that traditional view of power shifting or evolving in any way? So I do see it shifting. Um, I, first of all, when I was uh, working on this Women's Leadership Council, I learned that there was power in three. So if you have um, three women on your leadership team, if you have three women on a board, if you have three women in a meeting, the power shifts. And women feel equally powered and equally supported. Whereas when you have one in a room, and one on a leadership team, or one on a board, they don't feel as empowered. And so I, I, you know, learning that, we used to stack the deck and make sure that we had three. And I worked with a group called On Board, which also now promotes women being on, board, in, on boards, corporate boards. And we understand how important it is to have a minimum of three women there for them to feel like they can contribute and have their voices heard. Um, because you know, we all lived our lives through the you know, you say something and it kind of falls flat in the room and then a man repeats exactly what you said, sorry guys, and all of a sudden it's brilliant, right? And so we, we all suffered through that, but the interesting thing is what, what some of us stopped to take away was the, act, the idea was actually brilliant. It was just brilliant when you said it and it was brilliant when he said it, but you said it first. Then you need to take, you know, the fact that it was a great idea and then use that to, under, to know that your voice has power and it means something and could stay, continue to, um, and we're having a change here, um, to have, and, and to continue to put those ideas out there because eventually you'll get the right advocates in the room that will stop and say, wait a minute, Kathy said that, he didn't say that, Kathy said that, right? So, and, and sometimes you get senior enough in a role and you go, hey, wait a minute, I said that, which isn't encouraged, but occasionally is appropriate. Um, so yeah, there's a power in three, and then, nice to see you, um, and then uh, the power shift, I think, with, uh, uh, as, we, as a, we have come through generations, I was telling someone earlier, I'm reading this book called Generations, the power in that we have, it's all basically because of technology, we have access to information faster, we have, um, uh, um, technology allows us to do things differently, and so from generations past, we now have technology that allows us to now take different roles in leadership positions, allows us to be present in different leadership, because we have more time on, because some of technology, but also because we have more information and because we now can um, work together differently, support each other differently. So I think power is shifting because we have a way now of supporting each other. Welcome, Stephanie. Hey, Stephanie. 
I just wanted to say hi to everyone. I hope that everybody realizes how incredible they are. I know them personally. Katie and I are in the same Leadership Atlanta class this year. We have a whole Leadership Atlanta table. <laughs> Kathy and Katie and I are all in Rotary together. But the one question I always ask every year, because we've got a lot of young women in the audience, and I hoped you two would talk about it, because I know you are a mom, um, and I know you're a great aunt to lots of young people. How important is the person that you choose to make your partner in life, to your success and to your goals, the people that are in your inner circle? You wanna go? You wanna go? I can go, go ahead, Kevin. I just finished talking, you get to go. Um, I, I was early in my career and I was having a kind of a coaching conversation with, with the leader that I was working for and I asked a question around, you know, to what do you attribute your success? And he looked me without, without a beat and looked me in the eye and said, my spouse. And it was so unexpected. I'm not even sure I was married at the time. But he said, having a spouse who supports you and can and be the yin to your yang and, and complement um, what you're trying to accomplish, complement with an E, not an I, um, is so important to success. So um, I got married later on, and um, it, it's so true. And, and, but it's, it's true to the, to the positive and also to the negative as well. But whether that's a spouse or having family, your children, your, your inner circle of friends who can um, support you and embrace you is so powerful. Uh, I'm part of a running group of, of Moms, um, I guess yeah, we're all moms. We meet at we meet at 5 a.m. every morning, and we and we run. And man, I'd give them credit for my success too, because they are the people that I can just be my real, authentic self with. And we talk about work a lot, not all the time, but we talk about our accomplishments. We talk about our challenges. We talk about how. I cried at work yesterday and I'm so mortified or you know, someone did something, but having that personal, just board of advisors or friends and spouse really can save you in some really tough times. And I agree that that person in your life that supports you, that um, is there uh, regardless of the good time, good day or bad day, is uh, having that right person be there is incredibly important. And I, I talked about how I, with the Women's Leadership Council for Coca-Cola and went around the world. When we were in meeting in various places around the world, we would bring in women in that area, whether it was Saudi Arabia or whether it was Latin America, and we would ask them the question, and every one of them said it was key to their success that they, their spouse had was um, that they married the right person, some of them two or three times by that time, <laughs> but um, <laughs> that they had, yeah, yeah, but they had married the right person, finally, and um, that, that person was incredibly supportive. And, and for me, uh, even having no children, but having a, parents that were aging, um, for me, it was, I, you know, I ended up traveling a lot with Coca-Cola, and to know that if I could not make it back on a weekend to go have breakfast and, and sit with my, my dad, that Kenny, my significant other, was gonna be there and gonna go do that, because he understood just how important that was not just to me, but to my dad, meant the world to me. And so I never had to worry about, you know, the, well, you know, leaving things at the house, like, you know, every now and then, you know, dust bunnies show up or whatever, but I never had to worry about any of that because it didn't, it, it, we were equal partners. And um, if I was having a bad day, he was there to listen or not when he realized I didn't want to talk about it yet. And uh, I was there for him. So it, it's incredibly important to have that person that, is, that understands you, that is by your side, that knows what's important to you, and you know what's important to them. So for those of you who don't know, Katie went to the University of Florida. Go Gators. Studied to be pre-med. Had a couple of run-ins with organic chemistry. Inorganic chemistry. Inorganic, sorry. I tackled organic. <laughs> Which 
forced you to pivot. And that was one of the things I wanted both of you to touch on, the importance of being able to pivot in your career when you thought things were going to go this way and they instead go this way. How do you know when is the right time to pivot? And how do you prepare for that? And what do these women need to know about it? And men. So I'll start real fast. And as Stephanie said, I went to University of Florida um, and I entered as a pre-med. And um, I just struggled. And I had a, a really tough time. And my dad came down to campus and he marched me into the business school and said, you shall be a business major. And um, honestly, I mean, that's how I ended up as a finance major because it fit my calendar. Because <laughs> that, and, and but next thing I knew, I had graduated with the with the undergraduate degree in finance and ended up in a bank training program. Because why not? I had no idea what I was going to do after college, and it felt like a reasonable next step after after undergrad. And here I am, 24 years later, still with the same organization and a wonderful organization who has provided um, me a lot of opportunity, and, and I'm so grateful for that. But this notion of having to pivot, I still struggle with knowing, you know, when to pivot. I'm, I'm, I am not a risk taker. And I look back at my career and there were moments in my career where I wish I had taken some risk. And it's all worked out just fine. I mean, you, you hear about, you know, promotions and I'm in, I'm in the best job in the bank, in my, in my opinion. But no one knows about the three jobs I didn't get before I got this one. Right, um, so I don't have the, this magic answer to pivot because I'm, I'm always looking back and wondering should I have taken this other path. I'm just trying to live in a little bit more of a place of gratitude for what I do have and giving myself some grace that when I make a mistake or things don't work out the way that I anticipated, having the confidence that something else will come my way. So from the time I was six years old, I was gonna be a lawyer. I don't know if any of you ever saw Perry Mason, it's, it's in reruns, but I was gonna be Perry Mason from the time I was six years old. And if, you know, my, my, my parents, everybody said, oh, she's gonna be a lawyer. I mean, everybody said that. And so I go to college and I am uh, taking uh, history and political science because that's the track to go to law school. And I graduate undergrad and I take a year off and I work at the city of Rochester. I went to school in Rochester, New York. I'm a native of Atlanta, went to Rochester. Whole nother story, don't even ask. I actually had that in my question. Uh, yeah, don't Why ask. Why Rochester? <laughs> okay, there, I, I'll finish this story. We had time, I'll go to that story. But then I, um, I took a year off and I worked in the city of Rochester in their budget bureau. And I loved the work. But then I was gonna go to law school, right? And I'm talking to my sister, who was probably my first mentor. Well, she wasn't nice about it, though. She'd say, no, but. And she said, stupid, why don't you go get your MBA instead? And so I started looking into it, and I decided to go get my MBA. But it was such a hard decision, because from the time I was six, I was going to be a lawyer. And my parents would say, she's going to go be a lawyer. You know? And so I felt like I was letting people down by not going to law school. And then but then I loved what I was doing. And so I made a decision right then and there, which I have basically kept to, is that I'm gonna love what I do, right? There might be opportunities out there that are, um, you know, other people would say are good for me and good learning, et cetera, and I should go do them. But if there's something in my soul that doesn't say it's something I'm going to ultimately learn from and enjoy, I'm not gonna go do it. So I made that switch. I went to, to uh, get my MBA instead and um, set on this path that led me to chief financial officer of the Coca-Cola company many, many years later. And I'm grateful that I did because I loved every minute of that journey. And yes, there were other jobs that I either didn't get or um, were offered that, um, but when I, I mean, I, I, I listened to my gut. I prayed about it and I decided, no, there's something about that that's not for me. And, and I made a decision and then I did my best not to second guess my decisions. I moved forward and made and just decided this is the right path and it's gonna, you know, we're gonna make the best out of it and it worked out. So that I that's my path. I do believe in pivoting. I do believe you follow, um, you know, you pray about it, you you know, follow your gut and then but if something is telling you this is not the right direction. Even if that door isn't quite open yet in the other direction, it'll open. I do believe that firmly. 
Jaden, I'm gonna leave you with the last question for these two amazing women that you wanna ask them. On the spot, yeah. let me see. I would say, okay, what has been the most rewarding thing in your life? I know we've talked about kids and finance and careers, but to you personally, what has been the most rewarding? You go first. <laughs> no, the most rewarding. Um, so my parents, obviously very important to me, is your parents are very important to you, but my parents never understood what I did. Like they, um, <laughs> I, I could tell them all I wanted to, and then my, my dad just thought I ran Coca-Cola. That's all he's cared about, right? So that's what, it's what he thought I did. Yeah, exactly, and very proud of you. But I remember coming home and saying to him that with a letter in my hand that I was about to be an officer of the Coca-Cola company. Yeah. Um, and I was proud of that. He was incredibly proud of that. And, and he had no idea what it meant, none whatsoever. But it was, um, I, I gave that to him is what I feel like, right? Because it meant so much to him. Um, and being able to, to, after all the sacrifices they made for me, to be able to go to him and say, you know what, this, it paid off, here it is, and it meant the world to me. That's great. Um, Katie. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I went to the University of Florida. A little bit more behind that, my grandfather immigrated to the United States from Cuba. And he came over here in pursuit of an education. And he uh, went to the University of Florida and he triple lettered in swimming, diving, and cheerleading. <laughs> and after graduation, he, he settled in Jacksonville, Florida and he was the swim and diving coach at the bowl school in Jacksonville for over 40 years. My, my dad went to the University of Florida. So I was a third generation University of Florida uh, student and now alumni. And um, last year, um, I got asked to join the board of Warrington College of Business at University of Florida. And um, I remember making that phone call to my dad and my aunt and uncle who also went there and, and shared with that. And to your point, Kathy, the, the pride, I was so proud of myself, but I was so proud on behalf of my entire family and the sacrifices that they made in pursuit of, of a good education. So, go Gators. <laughs> yeah. Please join me in thanking Kathy, Katie, and Jaden. Again, another round of applause. Thank you for empowering, inspiring each of us to ignite change in our own spheres of influence. So now I'd like to bring Pam and Danielle. They're gonna tell you a little bit more about what's next. Thank you again to Katie, Kathy, and Jaden. They were awesome. Let's give them another round of applause. Um, I'm Danielle Hegedus. I'm the immediate past chair of the Champions Club for Girls. Uh, I started, I joined a couple of years ago. I, like Terry Fishback had shared, I started to hear about some of this awesome programming that was happening for young girls here in Atlanta. Um, I heard about this one thing where they were encouraged to write their stories and they'd write them down and then they would have a public reading and then they would have a book signing. And I remember thinking, if you're 13 years old and you've done a book signing, what boy is going to peer pressure you? <laughs> you know, who is going to make you feel intimidated? And just thought about the confidence that those girls would have and the self-worth, and I thought, I have to be a part of this. And so this club means so much to me for what it's doing across Atlanta, and I'm very excited to welcome in some new leadership um, with Pam Tipton. So let me allow her to introduce herself. Pam. Thanks, Danielle. So I'm Pam Tipton, I'm a member of the Emory Executive Education team, and I will tell you that I was invited to this event last year by my friends and colleagues, Jen Eames, who serves as my now current co-chair, and by my friend and Agnes Scott alum, Whitney Brown. And it really took just this one event to hook me because I got to witness the incredible, empowering work of Boys and Girls Club of Metro Atlanta. Last year, we featured, for those of you who were here, 
uh, featured some of those who'd participated in the poetry slam. And I was astounded, just like with Jaden, at the poise and charisma that was demonstrated in these young women that I just had to be a part of it and to quote Jaden, stand 10 toes down. <laughs> so um, as Danielle will be talking a little bit more about, we invite those of you who are not yet members of Champions Club for Girls to join us because the club does things that speak to my heart and that is to generate and support academic success. I work in an educational institute, graduated from a women's college. Healthy lifestyles in multiple areas, not just about what you eat, but how you move and how you build healthy relationships. And character and leadership, as we've gotten to see today and other times uh, with Jaden and with what we saw last year and at Youth of the Year. And so, we are a part, as Champions Club for Girls, we are a part of giving girls the vision and the motivation to succeed. We do a number of events. One was mentioned earlier about uh, the, the send-off for our seniors, help equip them for what's next in their life. And so that's an opportunity to come in and volunteer and be of service to the girls who are graduating from high school. We have other events that are just social and networking events. And so we would love to have you join us. And it doesn't take much. Uh, $600 is how you join the Champions Club. It's $50 a month. Or like I like to say, one shameful DoorDash order. You know the kind where you're like yelling back into the house, like the food's here, you know, to no one. Um, maybe that is a single experience, but. <laughs> So we would love for you to join the Champions Club. If you would like to, there is a QR code on the back of your program on the bottom here. But what we're going to do right now, if you're not looking to join, but you just want to help girls like Jaden have a great experience at the club, Erica is going to come back on stage and tell you about a few opportunities that you could specifically provide funding for. Um, so she'll say, you know, we need X amount of money to do this. You will wave your hand high, put the ring on, then we can spot you. And a member of the staff will go over with a pom-pom so we can celebrate your investment and you'll scan this fund the need code and provide the support for that. Um, anything else, Whitney? Oh, if you want to give via check or something like that, Whitney and Kristen, there's Kristen in the very back, they can help you at the end of the program. So Erica is going to come up, tell you about a few ways you can specifically support girls and thank you all so much for your time and attention today. And thanks to our generous event sponsors, ticket sales, and a few individual donors, we've already raised $15,380. So now we are really excited to get that number up to $30,000. So let's get started. All right, so again, the rings. We've got some folks looking for you, so just wave your hands high as we go. All right, so $5,000 is where we're going to start for our college and career readiness programs. We try to provide opportunities for our youth that reflect the many options they have after completing high school. Whether they're seeking employment, exploring college, starting a professional program like cosmetology, or joining the military, BGCMA is here to help. And so every year we take our high, we take our high school juniors and seniors on college tours throughout the Southeast, and we offer experiential learning opportunities throughout the year. So your gift of $5,000 allows us to expand the number of tours, trips, and more. So I'll get it started. 5,000, Whitney, note me please. Who else? 5,000. Thank you, Stephanie, I see that ring. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Anyone else, $5,000 for the college and career readiness programs? That's all right, we got more. $2,500, that's access to employment opportunities. So one important component of our comprehensive workforce readiness program is the hiring of teen club members. That's ages 14 through 18. And we work with them during the summer to provide job employability and soft skills training. As part of this program, participants explore careers, enhance their job readiness skills, build their basic money management skills, and benefit from on-the-job coaching. So $2,500 for this program allows our participants to work in their local boys and girls clubs. And this will help to hire one BGCMA, BGCMA team to work in our clubs this summer. And each year, just so that you know, we aim to hire between 35 to 40 teens. So any hands up 
for the Access to Employment Opportunities. Clotine, I see you, thank you. Anyone else? Here's another one. Any other rings? We'll, we'll try not to confuse your clapping. Maybe don't clap so high, so because we'll come and get you. $2,500, Access to Employment Opportunities. All right. Next one, we have $1,200 for the transportation to the club for one year. Part of our secret sauce at BGC May is the strong relationships and bonds our youth form with fellow club members and their staff leaders. But those bonds can't be built if the kids and teens can't physically get to the club. So BGC May offers transportation to many of our clubs via a club bus and a very nominal fee. So your gift of $1,200 right now allows us to provide transportation for our youth for one full year. All right, one right here. Oh, we got several. Thank you. And keep those hands up as we go. So $1,200 transportation to the club for one year. Got another one over here. This table. Kids, keep them held up. If you can keep them held up until they come to you, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, and then for $600, fun and educational field trips. BGC May is so much more than an after-school program. Throughout the year and over the summer, we take our kids and teens on some incredible adventures. Last year, over 200 club members had the opportunity to visit Tybee Island Marine Science Center and Dolphin Tour. And we also took kids and teens to the US Space and Rocket Center. Um, we had tours of local companies like Chick-fil-A and Papa John's, and we've had a little fun at Six Flags over Georgia. So your gift of $600 will allow us to offer even more amazing field trips in summer 2024 for our youth. So $600 is fun and educational field trips. Any supporters there? Thank you. And keep those hands up and they will come to you. Any other $600? All right, next for $250, we have healthy cooking classes. Our youth love the culinary arts and almost all of our clubs have teaching kitchens on site and we use them to promote and expose our youth to healthy foods and recipes. And some of our clubs, our youth maintain vegetable gardens as well and they can see how simple it can be to grow their own fruits and veggies. So a gift of $250 that allows us to offer a cooking class and or maintain a garden at one of our 25 clubs. So $250, healthy cooking classes. Awesome, I see some hands, keep them high. Thank you, thank you. Fantastic, we've got a table up front. We have our $100, we're getting down, here's some more. $100, we have girls team sports. So now that we're getting back to our pre-COVID numbers and activities, we're bringing back our team sports in a major way. And our club members participate in all sorts of sports, ranging from swimming to dancing, to cheerleading, to flag football. Yes, girls can play football too. And we even have a basketball league where club teams play against each other on a regular basis. So your gift of $100 allows us to provide team t-shirts and jerseys, as well as coaches for each of our sports teams. So $100 for girls team sports. Thank you. See some hands. Just keep them held high until they can come and get to you. Okay, all right. And then for $50, we have healthy after school snacks for one week. Many of the youth we serve don't always have access to a meal, let alone a healthy meal. So by coming to the club, we guarantee them a healthy snack and drink. This gives us the opportunity to continue education around health and wellness while also filling their bellies. Your gift of $50 allows us to continue providing snacks on a daily basis and offer education around building a balanced meal. So $50 healthy after school snacks for one week. Supporters there, awesome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. They'll come around. Um, and just so you know, again, just visit your program here. That's a QR code. You can offer any amount. We are grateful for anything. If you didn't find your level yet, just you can scan that QR code on the table and write any amount in that feels comfortable to you. So BGCMA has been doing this work for 85 years, and it's only because individuals like you decide to step up and commit to igniting the unlimited potential of every kid. So make your donation now. We thank you in advance. Every $1 makes a difference. Thank you so much for your generosity, for those of you who have supported already, and for those of you who I know you'll do it as you're walking to your cars. All right, so as we wrap up today's program, I encourage all of you to continue to think about one way you can be a champion for women and girls in your network. 
Perhaps it's sending a text message or a note of encouragement to a rebel woman you know. Or maybe there's a young woman in your life who needs a mentor. As Pam and Danielle said, consider joining Champions Club for Girls to get involved with Boys and Girls Club's programs that invest in young women. In fact, if you're a Champions Club member, could you please stand, those of you who are still in the room? So if you want to know more about this group, make sure you, you grab one of these ladies before you leave today so you can learn more about that program. All right, well, one more round of applause. And... Um, Thank you to all of our sponsors and our speakers and our moderator and our volunteers who made today possible. We really, really thank you. And a huge thank you to Saffold Barksdale and her team at Affairs to remember for today's delicious meal. And if you enjoyed today, consider attending Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta's fourth annual Top Golf fundraiser, Driving Great Futures, presented by Merrill on Thursday, April 25th at Top Golf Midtown. This is an annual fundraiser, and this event supports BGCMA's teen workforce readiness and career-bound programs that help young people step out of high school, prepare for a great future. So again, thank you so very much for attending today, our fifth annual Rebel Women Luncheon, and we thank you for your generosity, and we hope to see you in the future again soon. Thank you.